Hello everyone. I'm Yuman Sang. I'm the CEO and founder of Churn Zero. And I'm happy to welcome all of you to our webinar uh, titled Customer Health Scoring, the Why and How. Now, this is a, a 101 webinar. So these are really uh, for folks who you know, are new to health scoring uh, or you know, want to, want to st take a look again on how uh, best practices on, on health scoring. So this is how we'll work. We have two speakers today that will go over their own professional experience on health scores. I will introduce them in just a second. And following the presentations, I will take questions from this audience. So please ask your questions at any time during the webinar by submitting it through the webinar software. Just look for the section of the software that says questions. Now I'm really pleased to have two authorities on the subject today. Uh, first, Michael Blazell. Uh, in 2009, Michael founded the Customer Success Forum on LinkedIn. It has over 25,000 members today. And he also first started doing formal research in the development of the profession of customer success. In 2012, he also founded the Customer Success Association. I'm sure many of you uh, have been to his site, and he is the executive director. For those of you who have not been on the Customer Success Forum in LinkedIn, I highly recommend it. Uh, Michael keeps it a very clean, well-lit place, uh, safe place for customer success managers to ask each other questions. I'm also happy to introduce Abby Hammer. Abby Hammer is one of the founding members of Churn Zero and is a vice president. She's responsible for product strategy, product execution, as well as customer success. She has worked with many, many of our customers on their implementation and their health scores. Her past experience has been in customer implementation, product management, and product marketing. And she and I have worked together in the past, and she is uniquely qualified to build products for customer success. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to turn it over to Michael, and I'll be turn it over to Abby, and then back to me for questions. Uh, so let me go ahead and change presenter now, and welcome to Michael. Okay, Michael, you should have control Great. now. I do. Thank you, Yuman. How should I go about measuring the health of my customer relationships? That's a question that's been asked in very many ways in the Customer Success Forum on LinkedIn for years. There are at least two current dis discussion threads going on about it right now. I get asked about customer health scorings at most of the Customer Success Con events, and I've seen a lot of different posts and papers about it as well over the past few years. The reason that this question keeps coming up is that there is no one-size-fits-all when it comes to evaluating customer health even though Salesforce and most of the other CRM systems out there offer the standard green, yellow, red indicators on their dashboards. Everybody knows about the standard health indicators. But what exactly is the difference between a customer in the green and one in the yellow zone? Why in this is it true that what you don't know can hurt you? Well, let me give you an example from a popular billing technology company. I asked their customer success executive if there was something particular to them that could instantly turn one of their green customers into a red. There was. And it was something that might appear as a minor change if it happened with a different kind of vendor. They've learned by experience that all factors can be perfectly and consistently positive. But if the customer's CFO leaves and is replaced, that's an automatic code red scenario. The new CFO is very likely to have their own preference in building system partners, and they're the decision maker for that one. So that green health account can't be considered safe anymore. It's time to start the sales process all over again with the new person. Let me pause for a moment here to set some definitions that we can use for a foundation for talking about customer health. When you ask customer success people about their mission, you get a lot of different answers. And that makes a difference in how they might view customer health scoring. A team that's dedicated to onboarding, for example, would perceive a healthy customer to be one that's proceeding according to the implementation schedule. If they're taking longer than was planned, that might be a customer in the yellow zone. Reds, of course, would be customers that had stopped all progress. Another team, one focused on feature usage and adoption, might have a different view. A customer using all of the identified key features on a regular basis might be considered as green. If most of the users stop using a key feature or group of features, that might be a yellow indicator. And of course, if they stop logging on, welcome to red. 
Both of these views, while they may be perfectly valid for those perfect teams, those particular teams, aren't looking at a full picture. There are factors that aren't being considered. So my view is that the mission of customer success is to build more proven value faster for both the customers and the company. Now, we do a lot of things as customer success professionals. We help onboarding, we encourage adoption, we deal with code reds, but our essential mission is building proven value. In short, we're about money. That's the starting point, in my view, for health sc scoring for the customers. It's also the starting point for evaluating the customer success team in its relationship with its own company's senior management team, but that's a conversation for another day. In my view, there are three key questions to be used in designing a system for assessing the health of customer relationships. How likely is a customer to continue giving you money at the same rate or to stop paying and churn? How likely are they to expand their relationships so that they give you even more money? And will they actually recommend you to other prospects? I want to spend most of my time today with question number one, but all of our conversation can be well applied to the second two questions as well. The vital points to be considered, the purpose of the customer health scoring is to gather the right data to put that data to effective use. And the underlying logic is that the earlier you can get engaged, the more effective you can be and the less you'll spend. Let's talk about the threat of churn. My research over the years has shown that there are four main causes of churn, and the first is disconnection. Disconnection is the loss of contact or regard between the decision makers and influencers at the customer end and your company. Examples, loss of the decision maker, champion, or significant influencer at the customer company. Remember I talked about the building company when the customer CFO changes. Another example of disconnection is promotion or ascendancy of a detractor in the customer company, somebody who doesn't like you or your application. Or the customer was acquired by another company who may have their own preferences about vendor partners and products. All of those are, disengage, are, are disconnection. Disengagement is the second major churn driver. And it occurs when the customer scales back or stops using key features of the product or fails to start using them in the first place. Disengagement is also when the customer plateaus, stops progressing according to the customer success plan. The third is disvaluation, and this occurs when the customer doesn't achieve the planned profitability increases as per their last customer value review. Disvaluation factors can include such things as significant support cases are not being resolved, the, profession, the perception by the customer is that they're not getting their money's worth. Disvaluation can also occur when a competitor appears on the scene that offers more perceived value. The last but not least is downturn. Downturn covers such things as a decline in the customer's own business. Perhaps they lost their major customer or competition has cut deeply into their revenues and profitability and they can't afford their relationship with you as much. So what can be done about those four causes in time to do something about them? We need the earliest warning we can get, and that means beginning with the right data. Here are some sources for what I call the right data for you and your customer success team as you design an appropriate customer health scoring for yourself. As they used to say in the old car commercials many years ago, your mileage may vary. What's appropriate for you might not be for another team. Using each of the four churn drivers we just talked about, disconnection, disengagement, disvaluation, and downturn, ask yourselves and your team members, what data indicators might warn us of a customer beginning to go into one of these states? What priority should we assign to each indicator? What are our data sources? Do we have access to the data that we need? Is it in a form that we can use? Is it clean? And that's an important one. 
what is the feed methodology? Can we get the, the data automatic, delivered to us in a form we can use? Or are we going to have to assemble and massage the data manually? If so, is it worth the effort that we'll have to put in to get it? To what degree is the data based on or influenced by personal feelings or opinions. Now, you may think the data is significant and that it proves your point, but can you back that up? Do you have the data to support it? Remember, you're gonna to have to use this data to get others to do or not to do things based on it. So you need to consider how it will be received and by whom. Let's look in, at some of those possible sources for data that could go into determining the health of a particular customer relationship. The results of customer value reviews is one I like. Now, some CSM, CS teams call what they do QBRs, or quarterly business reviews. I prefer the term customer value review, and it's not the same thing. In the typical QBR, the CSM generally talks about the various types of interactions that have occurred between the customer and the company over the previous quarter. In a customer value review, the CSM goes over the proven value goals that were set in the last CVR and gets the customer's agreement that, in fact, that value was achieved. Next, the CSM works with the customer to set proven value goals to be accomplished during the next quarter. Note that we're talking about proven value in the customer's eyes. What do they want to get out of it? And the more you can tie that to money, the better. Note that the data you get from a CVR shouldn't be considered as absolute. It's very valuable, but you can't take it as, as the only thing you look at. The customer may not be telling you the whole story, or they may not be fully aware of everything themselves at their end. The goals that they want to achieve may or may not be the same priorities that their bosses have. Another one is progress according to the customer success plan. When you get a customer to sign on and begin the onboarding phase, one of the most important things that you can do is draft a customer success plan for that customer. What do they want to get out of the relationship? How do they define success? Using your data about similar customers, what is reasonable to expect in terms of progress through the customer journey map? Is there potential for them to become a tier one customer? And if so, how long should that take? What are the intermediate steps along the way? And at one intervals? The customer success plan should inform the process of preparing, executing regular customer value reviews. It's also one of the things that feed into your, your health plan. Now, when it comes to surveys, let me be upfront that I'm not a fan of NPS. I'm much more interested in how many times a customer actually refers people to you than I am in their statement about how willing they are to do so. Further, in my opinion, the best referral is when a customer says to someone in their network, you know, our profits went up 25% last quarter out of our work with the folks at XYZ Corporation. You ought to give them a call. They're really good people. But if you want your customers to give that kind of referral, then you need to be sure that they have the data to offer about their increased profitability, that they know what to say. Now, that being said, I know a lot of companies that take NPS and CSAT surveying very seriously. If you're going to use it, I think that it needs to take the type of responder into consideration. For example, NPS and CSAT data means much more to me if I know something about the people who responded, who gave me that data. If they're users of the product, what level are they? Are they line or management? Are they admins of the product for the customer? Are they decision makers? I'd want to track customer health scores specifically for those people as separate from everything else. Are they influence? Again, there are three separate categories under this heading. There's champions and advocates, there's power users, and then there are the, the detractors. These can be equal importance to your champions, and they also need to be tracked individually with a score. How, inf how influential are they? How much clout do they really have? Now, here's, here's some data that some might consider to be more solid and less susceptible to opinion. But is it? Remember, you still have to determine how much weight to give to it. When it comes to usage stats for specific features of the product, if you have access to it, this data can be hugely significant in calculating customer health scores. But to really make it meaningful, 
It needs to be specific for the key features of your product, and you will need to determine what are those key features and track their usage. Again, it also needs to be specific about the category of users. Decision makers, champions, or ad advocates, especially power users. This is a way by the by you identify power users. And then again, detractors. The overall engagement data is what you use to determine the percentage of the customer company that is using the product regularly and get a sense of the impact that the usage is having. It's also a useful track, if you're a software company, the number of licenses you sold to the customer and how many of them are actually being used. As you might imagine, if you sold them 100 licenses and only 10 are in use, that's not likely to be a healthy sign. Another group is the customer support data. The support team will typically have a wealth of data that they're frankly sitting on, just waiting for someone to come along and ask them for it. I've told clients for years that if they really wanted to know what's going on in the customer base, they need to go listen in on the conversations that are happening in the support center. The support people know a lot. They just aren't very good about sharing their knowledge effectively. Now, getting data about support tickets per customer is generally pretty easy. Any support case management or ticket system worth the using will have report functions that can give you this data by customer. It can also tell you a lot about priority of cases, severity levels, durations, and escalations. If there are open bugs, there will be reports on those issues and their impact, their priority, and their severity. But if you really want to factor in what the support team knows about the customers, and you should, you're going to have to ask them to give you more than case system data. They're one of the best sources of customer intelligence data about the personalities of the customer company. And you can give them questions to ask during their support interactions and the people that they're talking to are very likely to give good answers, data that you probably couldn't get anywhere else, and it really is nice to have for your health scoring system. Now that you've got all this data, what are you going to use it for? Some of the issues here are, who needs to be notified of which changes in the customer? If it's negative changes, who will take action to reverse the decline in health? Who needs to know about the sensitivity of the relationship at this time? For example, it's generally not a good idea to ask a code red customer to give you a referral. Positive changes. Who will take action to expand the relationship or to talk to the customer about becoming an advocate for the company? Which playbooks, standard procedures are triggered? What are the specific trigger points, the calls to action? How will you track those actions and their outcomes? And how will the results of those actions be fed back into the customer health scoring system? I've mentioned a lot of possibilities that need to be taken into account when designing or understanding a customer health scoring system. And you've got a lot of work to do in determining what makes sense for your company and team at this time, what's possible and reasonable from where you are right now. And one of the questions that needs to come up is simply to automate or not to automate. Yes, you can do a customer health scoring system manually using Excel, etc. But it won't be scalable and it's highly unlikely that it will be maintained for any length of time. Does that mean that you shouldn't do it? No. The exercise of designing it and gathering the data and reporting will be useful in determining what's important to you. And you can also give the output to tempt senior management into giving you the budget allocation so that they can have the data quicker and more effectively. You have to start somewhere, and this is a good use of time. If questions happen to come up for you after today, we'll take some questions at the end of the webinar, but if you come up with stuff afterwards, please join us in the Customer Success Forum on LinkedIn or at a Customer Success Con event or email me, and here's the appropriate addresses for that. So now let's turn it back over to Yumon and to Abby to hear about how Churn Zero handles customer health scoring. Great, thank you so much, Michael. Really, a really great introduction to uh, customer health scores with lots of great advice and guidance there. So thank you for that. Um, 
So for the, uh, for the second portion of our webinar today, I'm going to be building on a lot of Michael's recommendations and giving you an introduction into how Churn Zero approaches health scoring, what we call Churn Scores. I'm also going to be sharing some best practices that we've uncovered over the years as we've worked with our customers to develop thoughtful scores that empower their customer success teams to be more proactive and more strategic in how they manage their customers. So let's start at the very beginning. How do we go about creating our health scores? And a lot of this Michael already touched on for us, but I want to go into some specific things we should think about. So the first thing, the first and in some ways the most critical step to creating an effective health score is going to be segmenting your customer base. So none of us have perfectly homogeneous customer bases. And if we assess all of our customers as though they're the same, that's going to result in health scores that are not very accurate and not very helpful. Now, depending on the nature of your product and the design of your customer success programs, there's a variety of ways you could segment your customer base. And during implementation, Churn Zero customers work very closely with their dedicated CSM to determine natural and meaningful segments of customers to score differently. And I use the words natural and meaningful, meaningful very purposely here because it should be decently easy to categorize your customers. The distinctions should be somewhat logical. In our experience, if it takes a committee and many, many meetings to decide what your customer segment should be, your criteria is probably getting too complicated. So on my slide here, I'm highlighting a couple of factors that we've seen customers use to great success when segmenting their own customer base. And all of these factors can have an impact on how a customer uses your product and also how they might engage with your CS team or other customer facing teams. And therefore, these factors are very important to consider when you're thinking about developing a score that represents a customer's health in its entirety. So life cycle stage, a customer who's actively onboarding is going to be very different than one who is already fully onboarded or a customer that's been with you for two plus years. You want to take that into consideration. Uh, addition or available features. This may seem like an obvious one, but you don't want to score your customers on the use of a feature they don't even have access to. And beyond that, if you are a software group that has additions of your, of your product, as someone moves up in those additions, it can be critical to focus your usage on the features that are specific to that addition because you want to make sure that you're, you're uh, tracking that they're getting the most out of that addition and avoid any downgrade requests. Looking at services purchased can also be an important way to segment. So a customer that is self-serve is going to be very different than a customer that is actively managed, particularly when it comes to the resources that they can leverage. Another uh, fairly basic one but important is the company size or the user base size. And when you group customers of like size, uh, that allows you to set common expectations across that segment. So comparing a customer that has 500 users with a customer that has five users is always going to make that smaller customer look less impressive, and that's certainly not the intent of the score. Uh, for some of you, industry could also be very important. That could dictate the exact features that a customer may or may not use, and it could al also dictate times of the year when they may or may not be as active. And then lastly, we have some customers who really focus on revenue, either the customer's current revenue or the potential revenue that you could get out of your customers. And you may want to focus your attention on those that have the biggest potential upside for you. Now, some of you might be looking at this list and saying, more than one of these applies for me. And it is possible that you could do a combination of these to segment your, your base to a degree that's going to allow you to create effectively different scores. Now in Churn Zero, once you've determined what you would like your customer segments to be and you've built those groups using our segmentation engine, you're then able to create unique churn scores for each one of these segments. So you see for in the, my example here, I have segments for my enterprise and I'm breaking them out by their life cycle stage. So my onboarding are going to be looked at differently than my tenured accounts. And I'm also pulling out my SMB accounts. I'm going to judge them differently than I'm going to judge my enterprise customers. And again, I'm looking at how they're being managed once they're onboarded. Do they actually have services that give them touch points with a human, or am I going to expect them to be self-service? These are going to impact the exact factors that go into my score and how heavily those factors are weighted. 
So let's talk a bit about the factors that can be within each of these scores. And Michael touched on a lot of these. So you're going to see some, some repeats here. You're going you're gonna to see me thumb upping some of what he said. Now, I want to start by talking about quantitative factors. So in our experience here at Churn Zero, quantitative factors are really central to creating an effective health score because they're A, objective, and B, they're easy to automate, particularly if you have a tool like Churn Zero. Uh, a health score is really only meaningful if it's going to change as your customer changes. So the more you can automate the scores, the better. Now, to acknowledge Michael's point, if you cannot automate, that does not mean you should give up and sign off this webinar and not, and not work on creating a manual score. It just means that you have all the more reason to pitch for getting the resources to get a tool like Transera that would help you automate. We want to make sure that we avoid stale health source because they can become inaccurate or even downright misleading very quickly. So a couple of categories here. I want to start with product usage. So this is a big important one. Michael talked about this one as well because it gets at really two core questions. One, is my customer using my product? And also, how are they using it? Now, when you score on usage, like Michael mentioned, it's important to remember that not all the actions a user can take are equal, and you want to focus your attention on the uses of, use of features in your product that are the stickiest and that are also going to produce, produce the most meaningful ROI for your customers. So a common example I talk to my customers about is everybody's tracking whether someone logs into their application. And while that's certainly important, you can't do anything if you haven't even logged in, just logging in is very infrequently enough to make a customer healthy. They need to be engaging with other features in, in the application. So while you might look at logins, that shouldn't be the only thing you look at. Now, beyond looking at whether a customer is using a feature, you also want to track whether they're being successful with that feature. And, and this goes to more towards the customer's opinion of their, of their own ROI, but trying to put some, uh, some measures around it. So whether or not a customer experiences ROI with your product is going to be a key determination in whether they renew or not. So let me give you a, a quick example here. We have a couple of customers here at Churn Zero who offer email marketing solutions. And one of the biggest things that their own customers are looking for is to be able to send out emails that get good open rates. Whether they're going to renew with that, with that company is dependent on whether they get good open rates. So instead of just tracking whether their customers simply send an email, you also want to track what the open rate is so that you can understand what that, uh, what that impact that the customer is experiencing. And to Michael's point about how that then can be pushed forward to referrals, you're giving them solid numbers that represent what you are doing for them, what benefit you are bringing. Finally, on the, on the product usage, you're going to want to prioritize recency and upward trends over time. This is going to allow you to identify situations where the customer may still be active, but their degree of activity is starting to fade. And the sooner you can get in front of situations like these, the more likely it is that you'll be able to get the customer back on a path to success. Uh, and watching trends over time is also a great way to isolate upsell opportunities. So there's both the, the positive and the negative here. Now, other categories on my screen, Michael spoke about some of these as well. Uh, when we look at service utilization, definitely want to be looking at whether customers are using the new features. So do they get stuck in just the what was there when they first joined, or can they grow with you as your product grows? License utilization, uh, if they are not using all the users that they've purchased, at the very least, you're looking at a possibility of someone saying, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop paying for some of these users because we're not using them. On the other hand, if you see someone who's always tapping up against their license utilization, that's an opportunity to get them to sell them some more users. You certainly want to also look at how they're using their purchased services, so tracking meetings that happen around that and deliverables that happen around that, and their use of online resources. So are they going to, uh, to your knowledge base? If we move up here to the support history side, we can also look at are they attending webinars? Are they going to trainings? And I wholeheartedly agree with Michael on the support, uh, on the idea that support has a wealth of information that you should be digging into. So ticket history can be very important. SLA issues is another thing to look into. So if you have a customer who's consistently hit some very big bugs or have had to wait for a really long time for certain issues to be resolved, that can have a very big uh, impact on their health score. 
And last in our quantitative section here, we, I, it's worth talking about customer loyalty. So if you do uh, net promoter scores or if you do CSAT, you can certainly take those actual numeric values into consideration. Uh, if you're like Michael and you want to look at the actual number of renewals that have been done instead, well, that's quantitative. That's something you can certainly include in your score factors as well. And in the scenarios where your product teams or your support teams may be sending out surveys to the base to ask about satisfaction or questions around how they use the product, it might be appropriate to include some of those scores in your, some of those uh, values in your score as well. Now in Churn Zero, once you decide what factors, what quantitative factors you want to be tracking, you can build them in as unique factors in your score. So we have a couple of examples here. And uh, like Michael was mentioning, uh, and like I reiterated, we have uh, lots of features that you could be tracking and you want to weigh them distinctly. So in my example here, I do have logins. And even more to the point, I'm looking for logins by specific types of users. So maybe I want to score logins by different types of users differently. And while that's important, it's not as important as doing another action, which is email sent. I can be looking at license utilization. I can also be looking at aggregates that we track over time that allow us to see how much someone is using the product. So in this example, I'm uh, saying any customer that's using 80 plus percent of their monthly emails, that's, that's great. That's a really good sign that someone who's fully using the tool. So these are just a few examples of quantitative scores. Next, let's talk about some qualitative factors that might be worth including in your score. So first, it's important to note that while qualitative factors can add important color to a customer situation, they need to be used wisely because by their very nature, they're subjective and they're also prone to getting stale. So if you have a high touch customer success team, qualitative factors are going to be much more reasonable for you to take on than if you have a high velocity team where each CSM is greatly outnumbered by the customers they're responsible for. But if you are on a high velocity team, this doesn't mean that you have to completely forego qualitative factors. It just means that you need to be more discerning about when and how you use them. So, for example, you may not track qualitative factors for all of your customer segments, but maybe you do want to track several, uh, several qualitative factors for your largest customers or your strategic customers. Now, for any qualitative factor, the biggest piece of advice I can give from my experience working with customers is to set and enforce clear definitions around these subjective measures. So don't just create a CSM sentiment field and throw in a green, yellow, red option and call it a day. What CSM number one thinks is green could be totally different than what CSM number two thinks is green. And then your measure becomes very blurred and, and pretty useless. So instead, when you introduce qualitative measures, you want to make sure you take the time to discuss the definitions with your team. Maybe you even want to create a document that captures these definitions for easy reference. But you want to make sure that you're clear about what needs to be true or what cannot be true in order to score a customer a certain way. And finally, uh, I'd also strongly recommend that you enforce processes around how frequently these fields have to be updated. So in Churn Zero, this, you could do this using our automated plays and we could routinely task your CSMs to update those measures. But if you're going to, particularly if you're going to weight heavily on any qualitative factors, you want to make sure that they are updated routinely. So what are some factors we could look at here? Certainly there, there are a bunch that fall, up to, follow in, I'm sorry, fall fall into a relationship quality category. So this could be things like how responsive is the customer to you? Do they cancel meetings all the time? Uh, what's their affinity towards the individual CSM they're working with, uh, towards the company as a whole? What's their engagement with the process? Are they always behind or are they able to keep up? There's a lot around satisfaction. We should always be looking for ways to quantitatively measure satisfaction like we just talked about, but there are also appropriate spaces to talk about the, cus the customer's value review, as Michael called it, so their perceived ROI and the speed to which they got to that ROI. 
Feedback from other customer facing teams can be really important as well. So the CSM may have a great relationship with the customer, but every time they engage with support, it's, it's a struggle or they're not engaging with their professional services uh, representative in the way that they should. So if you have meaningful engagements with these other teams, their feedback should be looped in as well. And then we also have a category around risk rating. So there's lots that we get to know about our customers as CSMs that can be difficult to reflect in the data. And these can be things like how mature is this customer? You know, how, how well are they going to be able to use this tool based on their own internal maturity? Uh, what is their fit like? We've all gotten a deal from sales that just didn't feel like a great fit. And while we do our very best to work with that customer and make them successful, uh, that, that can be an indicator down the line that there's a risk because the fit was never quite there. And then we certainly have scenarios that can uh, raise an eyebrow around competitor risk. If we're getting lots of feature requests um, and we, if we're able to count those up, all the better because then we can quantify this, uh, quantify this a bit. But if someone's constantly talking about what the tool cannot do for them, then that's also a sign that uh, we may not have a great fit there. Now, once we've determined what qualitative scores we want to have, again, we can build those into churn zero and say, does this score make my, make my overall churn score better? Does it make it worse? And by how much? Now, something interesting here when it comes to looking at quantitative versus qualitative scores is that I have a few customers that approach this in a very interesting way where they choose to keep what we call their churn score, they choose to keep that almost 100% quantitative, very objective. Now that doesn't mean they don't track qualitative measures, they just don't loop them into the churn score. Now while some customers want everything in one score, they want it to be a complete view of the customer's health, in, for some customers it works well to keep these separated because then we can find situations like we have here with customer number four, where their churn score is very concerning but when we look at their qualitative factors, we see that they're a strong fit, they're mature, they have a good relationship with their CSM. So we're seeing a disagreement between our quantitative and our qualitative factors. And that's a situation that we need to address. One last thing about building the scores themselves, you'll probably notice in my screenshot here, in my screenshots as we go through, that you're able to weight each of your factors. So Michael said this a couple of times and I, I wholeheartedly agree that not every factor should be weighted evenly. And when you get started, a lot of times weighting can be the most complex part is you know what factors are, but which one should take up which percentage of the score. So sometimes there's some taste testing involved in this. You put in some weights, you follow your gut, and then you look at the scores that, re that are produced and you go back and adjust as needed. All right, with my last few minutes here, I want to talk briefly about leveraging your health scores to drive and even automate your processes. And I'm going to talk specifically about how this looks in Churn Zero, how Churn Zero helps you leverage the score, just so we can get a sense of how Churn scores would work in, in Churn Zero from end to end. So first, once you have these churn scores built, you're able to assess health across your customer in single views. And there's lots of views around churn zero that help you do this. This particular one is our dashboard, which every CSM can bring up and say, all right, for the accounts I'm responsible for, how many are green, low risk of churn, how many are yellow, medium risk of churn, how many are red, high risk of churn. And I can see that across my number of accounts that I'm responsible for and also the revenue that I'm responsible for. And I can also fil filter in and focus on accounts that are just coming up for renewal more immediately. So I may have 169 accounts, but 11 of them are coming up very soon and two of those are red. Maybe that's where I need to focus my attention. In that same vein, we have some views that help you prioritize your upcoming renewals. And some of our customers prioritize their upcoming renewals based on this churn score to great effect. So they'd look at this hot list and say, all right, I, in, 30, in 30 days I have these 10 customers coming up for renewal. I'm going to focus on my green customers first because those should be simple renewals to grab a hold of, get a signature on the line, and move on. My yellow and reds, those might take a little bit more effort, so let me go ahead and grab the low-hanging fruit, secure those numbers for the quarter, and then move on to more difficult customers. 
Now once you have this score, you can use this score in any of the segments that you create around churn zero. So this example that we're looking at here is a segment specifically of customers that have a, a high churn score. And you can use this segment then to report in and of itself. So I can look at this segment and say, all right, Valerie has 39 customers that are in concerning health. You can use this segment to filter reports around, uh, around Churn Zero as well. And you can also use this segment to tr trigger actions in the, in the software, which we're going to see in a second. But when I'm sitting on the segment itself, I can even create a mini report in here. So I can look at some key pieces of information, not just the churn score, but also potentially some insights into the factors going into that churn score. What is this account's usage frequency and uh, how many times have they logged in? How many times have they been active in the last 30 days? How many days have they been active? How many contacts have been active? So allowing you to get a sense of what's going on straight within the segment before you start diving into individual accounts. Now this segment can then do things like trigger proactive alerts for us. So let's say we have this, uh, you know, this segment of customers who are high risk, and when a new customer enters into this segment, that should alert the CSM that's responsible for them. And alerts can come to the CSM or to the manager in a variety of different ways. It can come inside of Churn Zero. It can come as an email. It can come via Slack or text message if you're feeling um, like particularly being on the ball. But this allows you to get in front of a situation. If your churn score has been set up to allow you to get in front of uh, fading away usage, that means when someone enters into the red, that doesn't mean they're lost. It means you now have an opportunity to course correct. And even more to the point, maybe you don't wait until they're in the red. You fire a lot of these alerts when they go into the yellow, when they move from green into the yellow. And you can also use this segment as the trigger to automate your processes and to automate communications with your customers, not only inside your product, but also via email. So we're seeing just a, a quick little play that I built here that has a couple of steps and these plays can create tasks for your CSMs or for their managers. They can send out emails and those emails can be, you can use merge fields and videos and images and all sorts of rich content in these emails to make them look highly personalized and also highly relevant. And then you can even do uh, what we call in-app announcements. So this is content that shows up for your customers inside the app either inside a success panel that we provide or perhaps as a slider or as a pop-up so that you're communicating with the customer straight when they're in with your within your product which is hopefully an ideal time to engage with them so I want to finish with one final thought here so many first timers with health scores really struggle with decision paralysis. I see this every single day where a customer will really want to get everything perfectly right off the bat and so it slows them into getting started with a health score. So my final thought is remember that perfection is the enemy of good. So my encouragement is to start with what you know. Test your, your assumptions and then you can continually revise your scoring and improve. A score should never be something that you set and forget about. It should be growing as your product grows, as your team grows, as your processes grow, but it certainly is also going to be something that you may have to work with and massage as you're, as you're making sure that all your weights are right and that you have the right factors. So don't be afraid to get started. And with that, Yuman, I'll go ahead and pass it back over to you. Great. Thank you. Um, so thank you, uh, Abby. Thank you, Michael. Um, that was very useful. I really appreciate it. Now we are in the Q&A portion of um, of the webinar. Uh, and so go ahead and use the software uh, to submit a question. I, I I'll go ahead and then um, uh, give them to either Michael, Abby, or both. Just a quick thing I do want to add uh, to Abby's last comment. Definitely get started with something. Um, actually, before I started Turn Zero, my turn scores were in a Excel spreadsheet. Uh, and I updated it once a month. And I'll tell you, it was better than nothing, uh, absolutely. So something is always better than nothing. There's technology that will help you with this, uh, but don't let that stop you. Okay, so let me, uh, let me go to some of the questions. Uh, let me start with Joe. 
um, he asks, well, you, you know, once you determine the metrics, any best practices about when or how often to review the metrics in use? So let me ask uh, Michael, why don't you take a shot at that? Um, you know, how often would you review the metrics that you've decided to use? Well, the answer to that is going to be variable depending on which company you are and what your market segment is. There's, there's some that have a more immediacy than others. Um, I think you're going to learn that over time as you, if, you know, you're always evaluating how good are my health scores? Am I getting surprised or am I missing things? And out of that is how you work out, you know, what the intervals are for, you know, reviewing your health scores. Um, I like... Oh, Michael. I think we may Oops. have lost... I hit, I hit the wrong button again. Ain't technology grand. Okay. Okay, so uh, I think you basically said it really does depend. Um, and so, you know, I, uh, that, any, anything you would add, Abby? And I also see that you're muted, so go ahead and unmute yourself. Was, is there a yeah, time when I you should revisit? Yeah, I think Michael is right. I mean, so let's say you haven't had any triggers to uh, to reevaluate your churn score. You know, you haven't been surprised by anything. That doesn't mean that it's necessarily all fine and dandy. I would say at least a couple of times a year you should be revisiting to make sure – uh, in theory, particularly if you're working in a in a SaaS product, uh, you're going to be adding features all the time, and how you expect your customers to use that product is going to be shifting and changing. And the score should be shifting and changing with with that. So, particularly as you have major releases, that should be an impetus to go back and review your scores as well. But certainly, any time that uh, you know you run into a situation where your health score doesn't end up lining up with what happens with a customer, that is certainly a big flag in the air that you should should take the opportunity to re-review. Great, thank you. Uh, here's another question from Andrew. Um, so he asks for quantitative scores. Uh, do you look at um, add-on revenue? So if if a customer continues to add on or lose revenue, uh, would, would, you, would you put those as indicators in mm. a churn score or a health score? Yeah. That's that's a very interesting idea. Um, I have a couple of customers that do we we've set up a calculation for them that allows them to see what their contract growth or shrink has been over over a time period, and then we use that factor in their churn score. So if their overall contract uh, is in is in the positive is growing upwards then that's that's a good factor if it's shrinking then that's not a good factor um, certainly anything that uh, that gives indication that your customer is settling in more to using your services and using your products spending more with you investing more with you those should certainly be things that we think about including in our in our churn scores yes you also definitely want to look at the when when you've got um, revenue decline when they're scaling back that's a time to go go look at that customer's business. They may be perfectly happy with you. It's just that mm -hmm. they may be getting hit by budget crunches, and you need to factor that one in. I mean, you, you don't automatically want to flag them as code red when they're just in a downturn that's likely to reserve to to reverse over time. That's great. I, I agree with all that. Uh, here's a question from John. Um, so, do you trust everyone on your team to take part in um, in determining a uh, health score? In other words, you think this is a bottoms-up endeavor or a top-down endeavor? Yes, as a matter of fact. You want everybody's weigh-in on that. Now, you're good, I mean, we're all people, and we're going to take different factors and think that, that some of them are more important than others. And, you know, that that's basic reality. That's going to happen to you. You're going to learn over time who tends to be right about such things, and you may adjust your approach accordingly. If you've got somebody that, that is a naysayer and takes anything as a, as a sign of doom and gloom, okay. But you know you don't want to broad, you know, apply that broad brush across everybody on that. So it, it's you know, this is stuff that you're going to learn over time, and you're going to gather data on to to, to fine tune this. It's not going to come out, you know, as Abby was saying, you aren't going to do this once and then never revisit it. I'd add I'd add one thought to that. So I have seen scenarios where they we get into a too many cooks in the kitchen uh, situation, and that's not to say that everybody shouldn't have the opportunity to give their opinions and to talk about factors they think should be involved. But if you're reaching a a, a space with your team where you're getting 
you're struggling to make decisions, it might be worth it to at least initially narrow the group, get something to start with, and then open up to a wider group to get feedback, just so that you don't get stuck in churning through the same, through lots and lots and lots of ideas. That's great. I got a question from Tim. Uh, so Tim works with a couple of on-prem customers. Mm -hmm. uh, so these are folks with applications that are not SaaS. Any specific insights or advice you can offer when your client is not SaaS? Oh yes, um, and I see this quite a bit. There's, there's a, a, a fact. The very first customer success team was set up by an on-prem company. It was not SaaS. Um, here is where talk to your support folks because again, they're the ones doing a lot of the interactions, and they can give you some feedback there. Another thing that I've seen done at, at several times to very great effect is you do the, you you set up an ET phone home setup where the application even though it's behind their firewall and it's you know on their premises it still gives you usage data and if you position this right and show a benefit to the customer for why this data can be used to help the customer generally they'll go along with you that's great um, okay so maybe a couple more questions uh, I have one from from Joy. Uh, so we did talk about having subjective measures and there's some risk to that because not everyone does the same thing. Any tips to minimize the risk for subjectivity? Mm. So a big thing I would uh, I'd bring up is that it is up to the manager of the team a bit to enforce some consistency there. So again I'll reiterate that defining your, your values, let's say you're going to have a, a a CSM sentiment and your options are going to be green, yellow, red, or one through five, whatever you, you go with. The more specificity you can put around those definitions, the better. So something like you cannot call a customer green unless you've had a meeting with their executive buyer within the last two months, unless they have at least two users that are logging in all the time, like, try to put a little bit of bounds around it. Now, that can mean that there's some research that's involved to be able to update the, the qualitative measure, but that's not necessarily such a bad thing. But it's also, it then comes down to the manager to do some sniff testing there. Um, you know, you'll, I've had managers who come in and they're like, oh, well, that person always scores too lightly. That person always scores too heavily. So you're going to deal with some personalities there, and the manager can be uh, a helpful resource there to just get everybody a little bit on the same level. And this too is, is, a, is something for the, uh, the customer success operations person, if you're fortunate enough to have one, that is, should be constantly looking into the feedback from the system. How accurate was it? You know, if we got, you know, looking at our, all of our Code Red customers for the last six months, what was the behavior of them? When did they go Code Red? How accurate was the health scoring and the automatic alerting that comes out of that? This, this is where the, the, the ops people or the, or the data analysts live and breathe and you really need people like that. All right, uh, and this will be our last question. Now both of you have talked about NPS and I actually have a lot of NPS questions on the queue here. Um, it's very popular, easy to do, um, you know, a pretty hot metric right now. Uh, where do you stand on actually making NPS a, uh, a component of the health score? Do you think it's important or do you think it's just one of many? Well, a lot of companies, because I just I asked one of this in, in the last round of research surveys and interviews, a lot of companies will put in NPS as part of the performance metric for the customer success team, but they'll use it in different ways. There's no real consistency about it other than, yes, it's a factor. How much of a factor can vary rather highly. As I mentioned before, I'm not a fan of it because you know I want to know did they actually refer somebody? That's the important metric to me, not whether really they say they will or not. And then again, who is giving this NPS data? Is it a casual user or is it your decision maker? There's a world of difference between those two people's opinions. Abby, what's your take on that? So I, I, I really agree with the type of user portion of that. I, I'm a bit more of a fan of NPS than it sounds like you are, Michael. I, I think it's a great way to get a pulse. Um, I think one of the key things you need to do with NPS is that if you're going to use it, you need to be implementing NP, NPS correctly, meaning you don't do an NPS one-off, you send to everybody in January, and then you are still using that same number in November. That's no longer a valid representation of how someone feels. So you need to be continually serving and making sure you're keeping that metric up to date so that it is a valid um, it is a valid look at how they feel uh, but I do I do strongly agree with you on the side of 
the type of user matters. Your how your decision maker, uh, what they're putting in as NPS is very different than someone who you know happens to log in once a week. So when you look at NPS, you might consider filtering it down to just look at those that are are going to influence the renewal decision. Certainly the economic buyer, but also your primary contacts and your biggest users. That's really where I think NPS can give you the most boost and should be the heaviest in your score. Um, does not mean it is the heaviest factor in your score necessarily. That would be something you'd have to taste test with, but certainly type of user can be very important there. All right, great. Well, let me end with this. Actually, the last question was, what is NPS? So for those of you who don't know, apologies, uh, it is Net Promoter Score. Uh, it's a single question. Are you, how likely are you to recommend this product or service uh, to a friend or colleague? And it'll be a zero to 10 um, uh, uh, score. You just, you know, so what, what makes it very useful is that it's very simple. It takes, you know, seconds of your user's time. Um, and in our experience, you know, you find a lot of surprises. People who you think are happy are, are going to score you low. Those who you, who you think are unhappy will score you high. So it's, it's always good just to always uh, check with your customers. Well, anyway, that was great. Hey, thank you, Michael. Thank you, Abby. And thank you, everyone, for dialing in. Uh, and I hope this was helpful for you. Like I said, there will be uh, a recording, and this will be shared uh, to all of you. Thanks again. Have a great afternoon.